Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for a free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Lauren Swinkles. Lauren, are you ready to join the mission? I'm ready, Andrew. <laughs> I, I know you are, and um, it's kind of fun to talk to you before because you are a type of person that is really prepared, so that's exciting. Let me introduce you to the audience. Lawrence, Lawrence is Associate Professor of Finance at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and executive director and head of quant strategy at Rubico's sustainable multi-asset strategies team. His areas of expertise include allocation research and empirical asset pricing. He teaches finance courses and has published his academic work in peer reviewed journals, such as Journal of Financial Economics. Lawrence holds a PhD in finance and a master's in econometrics from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Lawrence, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Thanks for the nice introduction, Andrew. So I think uh, what uh, really characterizes me in, in this world is the uh, curiosity that, uh, that I bring to the world. So I'm uh, very curious about uh, how people behave and why they behave like that. Uh, I think most people uh, think they behave uh, that's in their best interest, but Still, sometimes to me, it seems rather crazy. So I try to understand what is going on and how that, uh, um, how I, it is for them uh, something that is very rational, but for me, maybe uh, not so, because I have made a different assumptions or value set or something. And I apply it in my daily professional life to see how financial markets uh, work. So uh, for everybody recommended to buy a certain security, somebody also has to be convinced that it's a good idea to sell security. There has to be a win-win situation, otherwise there would be not uh, a trade uh, going forward. So why is it that somebody thinks it's a good idea to buy and another one thinks it's a good idea to sell? To me, that's a very fascinating uh, topic. Um, and what I try to do in this with this curiosity is to see whether I can find new data sets that kind of enrich my understanding of how financial markets uh, work. So um, this, this makes me just very interesting to see whether my priors that I have about how financial markets work, whether those are valid in this new data set or whether they're challenged and whether maybe I should change my uh, the way I think about, about finance. So I've written uh, many academic papers on this uh, new type of data set, sometimes collected by myself, sometimes collected by others, but applied uh, by me. So things like uh, emerging markets, uh, currencies, mm. frontier markets, bonds, uh, frontier markets, equity factor investing, uh, all these kind of things I uh, researched more than a decade ago uh, now. So I thought that was at that time very new data sets. A couple of years ago, I uh, applied that to uh, my thinking to China A shares, which is a newly open market for investors. So I thought oh, I need to know a little bit more uh, about that. But that's all kind of more recent things. Mm. I'm also very interested whether we can learn more about what happened in history, episodes that have not been explored yet. So together with uh, uh, Pim van Vliet, who was also on your uh, podcast yeah. before, and another colleague, Guido Baltese, um, we investigated factor investing over the past 200 years. So going back all the way to 1800 and on financial markets, how they functioned at, uh, at that time. And we remarkably find that like the results that we found uh, in the past 50 years, that they are not identical, but very similar over the 150 years before that financial markets were there. And during this project, I also got to read investment books that were written in 1850 or even before that. <laughs> and I was really shocked that people were not so stupid in that time. They understood many things about investing. Mm. So I also learned about that. It's easy to think that all our knowledge is gathered over the past 10 years, but um, hundreds, uh, maybe 200 years ago, people were, when it was about money, people were not that stupid. So they uh, had many good ideas. 
So I think that was something that really sparked my uh, curiosity in that uh, in that area of more historical uh, finance. And um, uh, yeah, that's good to learn these these things. Yeah. Most recently, I'm looking at uh, so to get to is real estate tokens. So like the blockchain and how that can be applied, or even carbon credit tokens. There's now uh, exchanges on uh, carbon where carbon credit uh, carbon credits can be traded. So I'm also interested to see how those markets function and why they exist and whether they will become big or not. Um, so a whole spectrum of yeah curious things that I uh, you're a busy man. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. A busy that's man. what you so... get if you're curious about all kinds of things. You <laughs> make yourself a busy. Yeah. You know, I was interviewing someone just this morning. I haven't come out with the episode, but it was uh, from a uh, the Association of Individual Investors in America. And they do a survey of their members. And they found that actually members have been ultra bearish. Uh, un, 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 they've never been this bearish for this long of a time, about 80 consecutive months. And it's kind of interesting because we had kind of a boom period, then we had a bust period, and then we've kind of had boom. You have the Russian war and, you know, all that stuff going on. And, you know, one of the things that I was wondering about, has time have times changed? Are, are we right to think that times have changed? Or is, should we think that this time, never say this time it's different because it's not. One of the reasons I was thinking about, I mentioned to him was, well, we've had an ongoing war. That can turn people pessimistic, even if the market's going up. And the second thing is that we have government intervention at a level never seen before in the history of, Mar I, I'm assuming in the history of markets, but you would know. <laughs> uh, and I think back to when I started as an analyst in 1993, you know, nobody was watching the Fed to try to figure out what's the Fed going to do tomorrow. And I'm just curious, like, and, and then you add on the barrage of information that's coming through social media channels and, and mainstream media channels. And then you add on that there's not a lot of investigative reporting. So we're just getting uh, propaganda from companies coming out through mainstream media. Uh, it's it's hard to see that that this time is not different. But what do you think? So, uh, yeah. So I think the circumstances, of course, they change all the time. So uh, life has come faster because now it's news from the US to Europe doesn't travel by boat, but it is in a within a second. It, it is. So things for sure have changed, but um, I think it doesn't necessarily mean that big picture things have changed that are important. So if you think about, um, like, like I said, the uh, how people who were in financial markets, what they were thinking, how they were behaving, how they were, maybe it was actually not that different. Of course, their information set was much smaller, but there is also papers saying that people in Amsterdam were waiting for the boats from uh, London to come in to Amsterdam to get the news from Amsterdam. And when there's a storm, then suddenly there's a lot of uncertainty because the boat cannot sail into Amsterdam. So there's a lack of news and people don't know what to do. So there's increased uncertainty, which has effect on prices in Amsterdam. So these kind of things make me think, yeah, so the speed, yeah, that, that's a completely different time, uh, time scale that we are thinking mm -hmm. about. But many of the issues that we're dealing with is making financial decisions that have, can have a big impact on our life with, in a world full of uncertainty, because there was a lot of uncertainty uh, maybe even bigger at, at that time, but maybe now there's more data, but maybe the amount of uncertainty hasn't really gone down. So how to deal with that and how that uh, gets into uh, asset prices, maybe it hasn't, uh, I think the uh, like fear and greed sentiment, mm -hmm. maybe that's of many times yeah. that we've, we've seen it and it hasn't changed uh, that much. But of course, yeah, there's the circumstances around the change. So mm. there's new assets that we can be traded now that could not be traded 200 years ago. But um, yeah, I think in general, the, the, the alternative to, because I get this question a lot with the 200 years uh, paper is like, people say, is it really valuable to look at what happened in uh, 1820 uh, or so? I said, well, at least it would be good to know what happened there, right? Mm. So you can always say that this happened because of this reason and it's not relevant anymore. But to say, 
I'm just closing my eyes and I'm pretending it never happened. That's another extreme way of thinking about it. So at least I prefer to know what happened and then try to see whether that can still be applied to today's that we can learn something from it today. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. And um, I know you mentioned to me earlier about uh, your global diversified, uh, you know, portfolio or your understanding of that. Maybe you can explain a little bit about that and what you've learned over the years so that our listeners yeah. and viewers can understand a little bit more about, you know, what, what, what should they know? Yeah. So that's uh, something I've been fascinated about. Uh, um, we, uh, we got many questions uh, at, uh, at, at Robico Um asking us about the market portfolio because you know that's what the cap the capital asset pricing model uh, says there's the market portfolio and what does it look like so and at what happened is that if you ask me i will would download some series and uh, come back to a client but if a colleague would do get the same question he would maybe download slightly different data slightly include an asset class or not based on his understanding of what the client wanted and then uh, at some point, uh, uh, Ronald and uh, Trevin and myself thought maybe we get this question so often, we should just write a paper about it, how to do it. And, and then and, we don't. And just to preface that, in the in, in the world of finance, we're we're taught to basically compare a particular stock or a particular strategy against the market portfolio, and the market portfolio is a kind of a what I was always taught is kind of a theoretical portfolio. It's it's a portfolio of all of the assets that are available in this world. It could be art, it could be stocks, it could be bonds, it could be real estate, it could be just many, many things. And so I always saw it as something that was a bit theoretical and you know, to construct something, maybe some bonds and some stocks. But I think you've gone a little bit further. So maybe tell us about what you guys did. Yeah, so what what we see then in the US, typically people just say, ah, uh, let's use S&P 500. Right? So that's kind of the, the shortcut. We know it's a theoretical concept. It's difficult. So let's use S&P 500. So what, uh, what we did is um, actually collect data on many more asset class. So corporate bonds, for example, is a big asset class. Not so easy to find data on before 2000. Mm. Maybe on the US, but on global corporate bonds, not so easy. So we had to go to the university library and to the, the stacks, as they call, so to the basement where all the dust is on the, on the books to actually open some old statistics uh, books of the IMF that they didn't digitize to actually get that data and make it public again. Uh, we looked at also at government bonds. If you want to go back to 1960 on government bond investing, it's not that obvious to get data on that. So um, on a global level, uh, because that's what we're interested in, um, we look at commodities uh, as well. Um, so all these uh, real estate, of course, but we uh, maybe that's an important thing to say. The theory, it says like this market portfolio that everything is included. But we narrow it down to saying we look at everything that is investable or invested by global investors. Mm -hmm. So that that's like a because a durable consumption or private residential real estate. That's not what we call the market. It should be something that a investor could actually invest in. Right. And um, uh, so that's what we do. We go back to 1960. And uh, first, we did a paper on the composition of the market portfolios. If you want to advise what. What is the market, the average dollar invested? Then that paper would actually say over time, this has changed like this. And at some points in time, stocks were 60% of the market portfolio. But other times, the stock market was only 40% of the market portfolio. So the market portfolio itself is not fixed weights. It's the 60-40 portfolio, something that we introduced, but it changes all the time. And uh, later, uh, after we published this composition in the Financial Analyst Journal, that people asked us, can you also collect returns? So then we started a project on collecting returns on these uh, asset classes and put them together to have the return on the market portfolio. And that's we published in review of asset pricing studies. Uh, but then that was on annual uh, annual data. And then many people who read the paper said, ah, do you also have monthly data? Because that's much nicer if you want to do risk analysis to have monthly data. So now we embarked on another uh, four year, well, I think we're working on it now for four years to collect all that data. And very soon we will have a paper out on uh, the monthly returns of the market portfolio going back to 1970 and mm -hmm. seeing how risks uh, have changed over time uh, in, uh, in that period. So I'm very excited about uh, about that. It's, it's a bit like a practical, that's my 
I like to read academic papers like uh, on the GAPM, but I also like to be practical on what can investors really do with it. So this is kind of my translation on what can you do with it. And on my university uh, data page, people can also download the data on the composition of the market portfolio for free. So I just update it every year there. So people can, it's a free resource for people to, uh, to check. That's if they're a, curious about it. Yeah. I'm going to have a link to that in the show notes. Cause I've been going through your site and it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you, you include the public data sets and then you have your list of research, which is really helpful for those of us that like to kind of crunch numbers. Uh, well, let me ask you a couple of questions about this. Um, the first one is, uh, I sometimes get annoyed when I see people talk about different asset classes because I really ask myself, is it really an asset class? So one of the things that I hear commonly referred to in the world of finance is, well, I invest in five different asset classes. And what are they? One is small cap stocks. One is value stocks. One is momentum stocks. One is large cap stock. And I think, wait a minute, aren't these all... They're just subdivisions of an asset class, just like bonds. You've got corporate and government. Are they mm -hmm. not subdivisions of asset classes or am I missing something there that I don't understand? Yeah. So this can get uh, this discussion. We also have with many people, so it can be a very uh, uh, tough, a long discussion without getting any results. So mm -hmm. what we did in most of the papers we have, Asset classes that is a little bit more, like say granular level and asset categories as we call them, where yeah. you kind of aggregate a few. But typically how we look at things is that you get um, uh, equities and that's just because like momentum equities to me is not a general equilibrium concept mm -hmm. because somebody is long momentum, somebody else must be short. So I have to, right. the market cap of, uh, of, the, of the portfolio. Um, but then we also include in the asset category, we also include private equity with that because equity, if you think broadly about it, equity is equity, right? Right. So, but you can discuss, so it's a separate asset class, private equity, because I know people think differently about it, but to some extent it's, it's equity. Mm -hmm. um, so um, real estate, we have as a different asset class because that's what many people uh, consider to be very different, but of course, um, well, you can also debate a lot of, what does real estate correlates a lot with equity? So it's maybe REITs are also part of the global equity market. So I think that's also a debate you can uh, you can have whether that should be separate or not. But I think many people consider it to be separate. So that's why we also separate that out. And then we have non-government bonds and government bonds. Mm -hmm. So that's what we split out because one is kind of government bonds kind of considered to be... Yeah, and it's considered to be like a safe asset. It has some kind of properties that maybe are a little bit different than uh, than, than corporate bonds where credit risk is more important. And if you um, if you went if you went to the highest level on the different groupings that you have, and we were to be um, follow my line of thinking, how many actual asset classes would there be? In other words, if we were to combine corporate bonds with government bonds and say they're bonds, if we were mm -hmm. to combine you know different types of stocks and say they're stocks, if we were to look at real estate, we may say, you know raw land is a different asset class yeah. than uh you know homes we know that homes through mortgages is a huge you know kind of separate asset class so maybe those are separate but would there be five different asset classes or would there be 50 different asset classes how would you look at it if you went up to the highest level no i think then uh five is like the the higher then i even separate out uh these the bond categories because I think I have only uh, commodities kind of left that you didn't mention yet. that can also be although there you have to be a bit if you only look at the futures of forward market then if somebody's long somebody else is short so we're looking at like physical like gold as an investment uh, for example like physical owning physical gold because that's a long only investment uh, and uh, a future on gold is uh, has a long party and a short uh, party so that nets out in aggregate for the market um, but I think if you have equities. Well, you, you say bonds. I still think that credit risk is maybe a little bit different. So I would say uh, credit risk, key bonds, and uh, safe government bonds, um, real estate, and uh, yeah, and commodities. So that's that's basically okay. yep. uh, it. But within these asset classes, like you say, we separate out different, uh, um, like you have emerging debt, uh, high yield bonds, all these kind of things. But to me, that is one level deeper than what you mean uh, right now. Yeah. And since uh, we've got the professor on, 
Uh, and I'm going to ask you the big question in just a minute, but mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could just teach us, you've done a huge amount of research over a long period of time, and I'm going to have mm -hmm. links to all that. So people that are interested in digging deeper, they'll be able to go to that. But what would you, what would you say is kind of your key learnings? I don't know the top one, two, three things that you've learned from all your research that you know to be true or as close to true as we can get in the world of science and, and academic research? What would be some of the things that could help all, all of us to, 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 to learn from what you've learned? Wait, that's a deep, uh, deep question, Andrew. After, uh, so I think one of the, I think why, how I combine also being in like an investor, working at an investment firm myself and doing the academic uh, mm -hmm. research is that I uh, think the, it's, I'm, I'm quite humble about what I, how I think I can predict markets. Okay. Because I think there's always, uh, uh, looking back, it's always um, easy, well, if you look forward, you maybe should say it's always easy to say, ah, it was obvious that the IT bubble was a bubble. It was obvious with hindsight, yes. But so I think these kind of okay. Uh, so that let's things, say that so, that's a principle right there to say it's very difficult to consistently predict the future. It's maybe let's say it may be even just a, a random outcome. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's possible, but I think it's not. But some people say like it's obvious. We mm -hmm. all knew that all these kind of statements, I think they're way overdone yeah. because it's yeah. extremely difficult and it's all probability games and some, uh, it's not all that, uh, or like this was the bottom of the market. It was clear that it had to, well, I'm very hesitant to say that that was clear at the time because most people were panicking at the bottom of the market. So that's. What about, uh, what about you've done a lot of work on factors and, you know, I know mm -hmm. I talked to Pim a lot on, on our episode about the the factors related to risk which was, I think, very fascinating and interesting. But I just wonder, from your work on factors, is there anything that comes that you think, okay, this is somewhat you know, reliable that I, I feel like I've done enough research to say this works or has a higher probability of working than something else? Yeah, so I think the, just the paper that I did together with Pim, where we look back 200 years and where we compared all the different uh, cross asset classes, the factor premiums, I think that really strengthens my, because like you said in the beginning, like maybe the times were different, but if the results of financial markets are pretty similar, that's also, that that's a very robust finding, right? The time mm. was different, but the results are, are, are the same. So I think for factors like low risk, uh, valuation, uh, momentum, yep. uh, that's, those are very... Uh, yeah, persistent robust. factors, <laughs> uh, robust uh, there. And that it also means that they, so a different thing than robust is to, it doesn't mean that they always work. Right. Because it's not an arbitrage in the sense that you, you know it's going to work. If you, so there are periods that are very tough if you're invested in these, uh, in these factors. But that's the reason that the only reason that they can keep uh, persisting is that there are people who throw the towel and say, well, this is not for me. Mm. And uh, and I think that's really uh, so really important. That, if it would be arbitrary, that's then it another would not exist. principle that uh, there are some things that work, but it you have to accept the fact that some things will not work for a long time, and that doesn't mean it's not going to work. It's just that there's going to be periods of time that is kind of a truth out there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So that's I think. Uh, 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 Always good to real, even does it if it works on average on the longer run. Doesn't mean that the next five years will be like that, uh, okay. and uh, or maybe even ten. Okay, yeah. um, those are some good places to start, and I think uh, I just want to you know thank you for taking the time to go through some of that. You you know it's really always interesting to talk to someone that's done a lot of research to you know try to understand things, and I feel like there's a lot more um, behind this discussion that um, I know myself and probably other audience members would love to learn more. But we got to get on to the issue of the day, and that is the following. Now it's time to share your worst investment ever, and since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it, and tell us how a smart man like you could have a story of your worst investment ever. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Andrew. So um, the... The story starts when uh, you already mentioned I started studying econometrics in Tilburg, a small town in uh, the south of uh, of the Netherlands. 
and when that time I moved out of my parents' place and uh, moved to that uh, to that town, and I was considering should I rent an apartment or buy an apartment. And uh, my decision at that time, I thought I would only do masters here for really four years. Probably the best thing is to rent and then uh, see where I, when I grow up, what I will do. Um, but of course, uh, that period, those, those four years, was very good years for the housing market, and uh, I decided uh, after my master's to do a PhD in Tilburg as well. So I stayed another five years there. But it was still a limited period of time. I still didn't feel like I really grew up. So I thought, oh, I'll continue renting, which was not a very good decision because house prices went up further. After I graduated, I moved to, uh, to Amsterdam, where uh, compared to Tilburg, the house prices were just unimaginably high. So I thought this has to uh, go down. It's, I, I will I will rent. So uh, I rented. House prices kept going up. <laughs> so then uh, when I moved to uh, uh, to Rubico, after a while, I thought I got a little bit tired of commuting from Amsterdam to to Rotterdam. I thought uh, I'll just I, this is the moment I'll buy a house in, uh, in Rotterdam where it's much cheaper than in Amsterdam. So it's like relative value within uh, the Netherlands. So uh, this this is a good moment. That was six months before the peak of the housing market in the <laughs> Netherlands. And uh, of course, uh, what I didn't foresee at all was that uh, five years uh, after that uh, decision, I moved to another country. So the background you see here is uh, is Norway, where I moved uh, to in the uh, uh, end of the 2012. So, and my uh, house that I bought, was 25% underwater. Mm. And that was more than 100% of my financial wealth. So it's maybe like 25% is not 100% loss, but if it's more than 100% of your wealth that you have invested in a thing that loses 25% of value, that was tough. So I actually only sold the house two years ago or so for a very small profit, but way less than what I invested in it to keep it uh, standing. So that was, uh, maybe it's like not the worst in the sense that uh, I didn't completely go bankrupt, but mm -hmm. something that really stuck with me on how that uh, one decision, or actually, and the decisions leading up to this for not buying a house, and then buying at exactly the wrong moment, really had, uh, well, severe financial consequences in, yep. the, in my case. So uh, that is what... Uh, what stuck with me this big big hit so so how would you describe the lessons that you learned yeah that's uh i, I was looking back at uh at that uh, i think one of the reasons also to buy at that time is that what many people told me and i wasn't really looking in the real estate but house prices always go up until they don't is what i uh, noticed but uh uh, I, I think it's something that people say, like it's uh, it's never hurts to own real estate. Or like I'm talking about residential, not offices, yeah. but uh, residential real estate. Well, my, at least my experience, uh, my right has been different in this uh, in this aspect. So I know that there is some uh, some risk in it. I also th uh, learned that uh, liquidity, because I, I thought even if the house prices go down, I have to live somewhere. So what mark to market is not important to me because I'm just living there and enjoying my uh, my garden. But if you move to another country, then the liquidity of being able to sell and buy a house in another place where you actually live is valuable. So that even though you are a long-term investor and you think you're really long-term, there may be things that cross your path for which liquidity can be important and valuable, uh, I think, that uh, it's easy to forget about that. Mm. Uh, I think what I already said before is that, uh, uh, of course, in 2008, Everybody said that they knew that the peak in the housing market was there in 2007. So, but nobody told me when I bought a house that the peak was there. So it was, uh, with hindsight, these things are easy, but uh, when you have actually make the decision, it is uh, uh, much more, uh, yeah, nuanced, I think, in many cases. Mm -hmm. And I also learned a little bit about my own uh, behavior. So um, first, um, 
like um, you see sometimes these emotional curves where people say, I should have bought, should have bought, should have bought. And then at some point you're convinced that you're buying, which that is exactly at the wrong moment to actually do it. So I think that's what happened. And then afterwards that people uh, say like, uh, uh, there is a, uh, emotional barrier to sell something with a loss. I also experienced that because of course I could have sold my house with a 25% loss uh, when I moved, but I didn't because it felt too, I don't know. I, I don't know what it's embarrassing or what uh, too much value in the in the house at that moment. Yeah. But at least I felt very compelled that uh, the market was wrong and uh, I should keep onto the assets for a little bit longer until it's back at its uh, uh, purchasing value. Mm. So I think these, uh, even though I know about these behavioral things and I study them, it is very easy to fall victim to them yourself because that's how behavior uh, works apparently. <laughs> so that's why I have, uh, I'm always, uh, so that's why I developed over the past years uh, or co-developed many of these quantitative or rule-based investment things to try to avoid the biggest kind of behavioral mistakes that you could, uh, that you could have, because I know it's so easy to uh, fall prey to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things I was thinking about. First of all, I'm, I'm, I still don't own a house yet. And I'm not a spring chicken. Uh, and uh, I rent. And I've rented all my life. And the interesting thing is I don't regret not buying a house. Only because I never followed house prices. So I could have been missing something huge that, you know, I just missed it. I, I did at one point in Bangkok buy a condo, but very quickly sold it and decided I didn't want it. And I did it twice. And I thought the second time, nope, I'm never doing that again. And so I never bought it. So I just for now in, in the places like America, as an example, there's so much incentive for people to borrow money to buy a house that it's hard to resist that, you know, very hard. It's free money, basically. But uh, what I would say is that for those people that that are considering renting, it's if you can find something that's really low cost, which Thailand in Bangkok, I've got something that's really low cost. I've been here 20 years uh, and I enjoy it. I like it. I don't feel any drive to uh, own a, a, a house. So that's the first thing it just made me uh, think about. And mm -hmm. and so that that was one thing. And then the other thing is just kind of thinking about um in some ways, when you buy a house, it's a trap because of the lack of liquidity. Yes, if the market's hot and if it's in the right place, you can dream about the idea that you're going to be able to sell it and you may be able to. But really, when you go into a housing you know, situation where you're buying a house, you, you should be very aware that the, the risk is, is that you're not going to be able to sell it at the time that you need to sell it at the price that you want to sell it. And in Thailand, in Bangkok, I would argue that you're never going to be able to get any appreciation in the price of what you're buying for most people that are buying because most people are buying condos in Bangkok. And the value of those condos 20 years from now is going to be much lower than where you think it's going to be because of all the new condos that are built all around it that people can go into. And so the risk related to home is that you don't realize the final capital gain that you thought you were going to realize. And it's not like a dividend paying stock. Well, okay, I didn't get the capital gain that I thought, but I did get these dividends for the last 30 years. And so that's the other side of it that I'm I'm just cautious about myself. Anything you would add to my, uh, my own experience there? Uh, no, so I think the, the main uh, reason what I think is why it is maybe a bit Different, you, know, you mentioned tax reasons. So that's, I think, a big incentive in many countries to yeah. own a house rather than uh, than rent it. But uh, the other thing is also about uh, the freedom you have on modifying your house. So I don't know, at least in my previous uh, places where I rented, I was very limited in cha making changes that I wanted uh, to do. And when you own a house, you can make it as you want it and it fits best for your family. And I think that's one of the advantages that you have when you, when you buy a house, that you can do that. That is uh, a limitation for renting. But for other things, I, uh, you know, also owning a house comes with problems. So it's, uh, it's uh, in, the, in a sense, I understand that uh, very well the time that I was renting that I could just, uh, uh, how to say, um, 
within three months, leave the place and go somewhere else and be happy somewhere else. That's yeah. that's also a nice, uh, it can also be like a nice comforting feeling that you have. Just, uh, it's not maybe all about money, but also about the peace of mind that uh, that it brings. That's, yep. uh, so, uh, yeah. So let me say, based on what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, I want to think about a young person coming out of university, thinking about buying a house, looking at it, going through some of the same things you went through, what would be one action that you'd recommend that they take to avoid suffering the same fate? Yeah, I think the the challenge for this problem is actually that there is not a lot of financial products or innovation yet that deals with it. So I think you ha at this moment, it is from in many cases, at least I don't know many counter examples, that there is a moment where you enter uh, you can keep renting, of course, but if if you're entering the housing market to buy, there is one time you own zero and then you own one. And it's not like something that you can do with shares, for example, mm -hmm. that you every month save $200 in and slowly build up your portfolio. So you kind of time diversify uh, away. So maybe the best thing, if you're not there yet for buying or you know don't know where to buy, is to get exposure to real estate through listed markets. Maybe it's not a very good, maybe it may be not a very good hedge, but at least it can be a hedge that if real estate prices go up, typically it is related to supply and demand in a certain area. So uh, uh, maybe that's uh, that's one way that you can partially hedge that risk that if house prices skyrocket, that you benefit from it through investing in REITs or so, and mm -hmm. that you don't feel completely left out that you have everything you had on a savings account and did not benefit uh, from that. that so that is... would be one uh, one of the things that uh, I think, but I think financial innovation can catch up here to make it easier for young entrants in the housing market in general. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great, great advice. I never even thought about the idea of getting real estate exposure because even, you know, obviously you're going to benefit if the real estate market rises. But the other thing is it's going to allow you to buy time. And you're not going to feel the pressure to jump into something just because it's rising because, hey, I'm already making money on that. And uh, my sister, who's a mortgage broker uh, in America, told me something I always remember, which she, I, I, I didn't listen to her when she told me. And I, she told me afterwards, uh, repeated it, which is only buy something if you walk into it. And it's like, I want to live in this place for the rest of my life. And that wasn't the way I felt. When I mm -hmm. bought the places that the condos I bought and sold, you know, it's more of a kind of investment because I just realized, no, I don't want to live here. So uh, this gives you this gives you uh, a chance to delay that uh, decision that you've got until you find that right spot where even if you pay more to get into that place of a lifetime that you want to be, then it may be that it really saves you. So I think that's great actionable advice. Let me ask you, what's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? I think if I can advertise a little bit uh, for myself, I think the at least the research that I did that I mentioned uh, before, I have a data page on uh, my university uh, uh, website. Yep. So some listeners might find it useful if they want to do their own number crunching, as you as you called it, to uh, to download these data sets there for free. So it's it's there available to uh, to check out. Um, I think uh, so. Yep. What would I recommend readers to to do? Actually, maybe it's not a book, an investment book or so. But what I was thinking about is what I personally do is check out Scholar Google or SSRN to websites where people post their the latest thoughts basically, and put some alerts out that you get uh, a message if one of your favorite authors or one of your favorite topics there's a new paper out that uh, on, on that topic, so you can learn more for free. Um, on uh, it's just open uh, open access, open source. So uh, you can uh, read the, the working papers, what people are working on and what their thoughts are at the moment. So to me, that is at least uh, something that uh, you can gain more in-depth knowledge. If you don't have the time for that, I think there's also several people that have very interesting blogs where they summarize the papers for you and the main takeaways. So uh, I think Larry Swetrow has been on your uh, oh, yeah. podcast regularly. And I think he has... Uh, one of the those blogs that are very nice, where he he does the work for you to summarize these latest papers and uh, and make it easily digestible for people who don't have a lot of time. So yep. that's another thing I think that is a very can be very valuable for people who want to know more about uh, how the financial markets work. That's great, and um, you know I just I just downloaded your data uh, from the the global uh, market portfolio. So 
That's interesting. I'll have a link to that in the show notes so anybody can go there and, and learn more. Great advice. Uh, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? I want to discover things that I don't know yet. So change my priors on how financial markets work. That's my my goal. And I hope to contribute myself to it. So that's uh, what I try to do, to do these interesting projects that will change my mind. That's the, the goal. Fantastic. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. And as we conclude, Lawrence, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Thanks for your interview, Andrew. If I may, I would like to end with a quote from the late Jerry Springer. Till next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.